Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown. Across the table from me, as per usual, is Matthew Stockton. Say hello, Matthew. Hello, Mike. How are things this week? Very good. It's sunny and it's a long weekend. It is May 2-4. May 2-4. Right? Um, it, not that that really means anything to us because we don't party anymore, but whatever. It's Queen Victoria's birthday. It is. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double, and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Terms and conditions may apply. Oh, dear. I don't know what those are, though. <laughs> we'll have to make some up. Yeah, let's do that for next week. <laughs> The attention-grabbing headline of the article in the province newspaper on the morning of July 3, 2013 screamed, RCMP Foil Canada Day Bomb Plot. A subheading read, Victoria, two British Columbians allegedly hatched scheme to blow up legislature. Since March of that year, RCMP had been engaged in what they called Project Souvenir, a complex and expensive sting operation to gather evidence against two Surrey residents, John Stuart Nuttall, 38, and his common-law wife, Amanda Marie Corody, 29, whom they suspected of terrorism. The RCMP alleged that the pair were Islamist extremists bent on blowing up BC's legislature buildings in Victoria and killing as many innocent Canadians as possible on Canada Day that year. On the morning of July 1st, the couple had apparently placed three pressure cooker bombs strategically near concrete planters on the west and east sides of the provincial legislature buildings. The grounds would later play host to thousands of Canadians celebrating Canada Day. The pair were then taken into custody in the hallway of a hotel in Delta, B.C., where they had used a room wired by cops for video and sound while they built their bombs and spoke openly about their plot to kill Canadians as the RCMP watched every move and recorded every word. But as the truth came out, evidence revealed that Nuttall and Karoti were not even remotely the devious threats to national security they'd been said to have been, and the RCMP had in fact, according to court findings, entrapped the pair. The bombs had been inert, made using intentionally flawed designs and materials handed to the couple by the RCMP themselves during the more than $1 million operation to bust them. You are listening to Dark Poutine episode 220, Set Up, The Bombing That Never Was. The news and circumstances of the arrests of Nuttall and Karoti, of course, made a big splash here in British Columbia and nationally. The Premier of BC at the time, Christy Clark, took to the front steps of the legislature for a dramatic news conference on July 2, 2013. Premier Clark said, quote, Yes, we will be vigilant, but instead of letting fear grip us, we will go to work today in this legislature. We cannot let this change us. We cannot let this event change who we are now and how we use our public space. This building belongs to the people of British Columbia. We will not let suspicion darken our hearts. Instead, we will remain open-hearted, depending on one another trusting each other, and we will not be seized by anger. 
Instead, we will continue to look toward the future of this great province with open hearts and with optimism. End quote. RCMP spokesperson, Assistant Commissioner Wayne Rideout, gave a statement on the events as printed in the Times Colonist paper and here summarized. Rideout said that the pair who'd been arrested wanted to, quote, create maximum impact and harm to Canadian citizens at the B.C. legislature on a national holiday. They took steps to educate themselves and produced explosive devices designed to cause injury and death. The suspects were committed to acts of violence and discussed a wide variety of targets and techniques. Rideout went on to reassure everyone, quote, These devices were completely under our control. They were inert and at no time represented a threat to public safety, end quote. Also from the Times Colonist, RCMP Assistant Commissioner James Malizia said the alleged terrorists were, quote, inspired by al-Qaeda ideology and were, quote, self-radicalized violence, although there is no indication they received any support from any international terrorist organizations. He goes on to say, our investigation demonstrated that this was a domestic threat without international linkages, end quote. Right away, for many British Columbians, came shock and horror. Canada Day, a national holiday, has historically been a time for Canadians to celebrate our nationhood, problematic as it is, warts and all. According to the Times Colonist newspaper on July 1st, 2013, quote, more than 40,000 people crowded into Victoria's Inner Harbour on Canada Day, many of them attending a concert on the legislature lawn, close to where the bombs had been planted. The thoughts that someone had been plotting to kill Canadians, many of whom might have been children, on that day in particular, was a horrific notion. It had only been a few months since the bombings at the Boston Marathon of April 15, 2013, by the Tsarnev brothers Tamerlane and Jokar. The images of the dead and injured in that event were still and fresh in everybody's minds. The Canadian couple of now-alleged Islamic bombers became targets of online vitriol and violent rage across social media platforms. Kelly, a commenter on a news organization's Facebook post about the arrests, wrote, Wow! Glad they caught them. Below that, in a comment with five likes, a Facebook user named Tom wrote simply, Hang them! Period! Further down, the same user, Tom, wrote, What would be better would be to put them in a room and detonate their devices. If they live, hang them. End quote. Ah, the digital lynch mob comes out. Yeah, well, always. Yeah. You know, this is why I am so glad that there is an actual legal system. Yeah. And not just, oh, okay, so this guy on Facebook with five likes said, <laughs> said to blow them up or hang them. <laughs> Let's do that. It's, uh, yeah. Giving me a little bit of hope for humanity, the most liked comment on the article was by a user named Nikki. She wrote, There aren't enough ways to say thank you to all of our integrated national security team for keeping us safe. Even more reason why Canada is one of the best countries in the world to live. So very proud, even more so than yesterday, to be Canadian. End quote. You know, Mike, I, I lived in London through a number of terrorist attacks. I think I told you this story before, mm -hmm. right? 7-7, um, the 7th of July, 2005, the London bombings. I just uh, left the Edgware Road station and about mm -hmm. 15 minutes later, a suicide bomber detonated. Yeah. Um, I was there just a couple of weeks later, another three bombs that were found and failed to go off in three other stations. I was there when a car bomb was discovered in front of a nightclub called Tiger Tiger. Mm -hmm. uh, when Lee Rigby was murdered, um, you might not know the story. I don't know that one. Lee, who is Lee, Lee Rigby? So he was uh, a drummer um, and he was returning to army barracks and he was murdered by um, a terrorist. Oh my. Yeah. And uh, I was there when another car bomb was discovered and, and made... I don't know how you de-detonate de in North Greenwich. So they disarm the bomb. Yeah, disarmed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you got to remember, this isn't the country I lived in. Mm -hmm. This was the city I lived in. Right. right. Like the train stations I went to, the neighborhoods I visited. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why, um, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why Justin and I moved back to Canada was that London, as he puts it, uh, was getting too, quote, bomby and stabby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so we came here for a bit of peace. So, you know, while I'm inevitably going to be critical of some of the mistakes that were made in this case, 
mm -hmm. uh, on the specifics of this case. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, I think the security services have a really hard job uh, and we do look at, to them to keep us safe and they've thwarted a lot of potential attacks um, and having lived through those ter terrorist attacks, you know, I understand that and appreciate the work. Some people were initially upset and puzzled that Canada Day celebrations had gone forward in Victoria on July 1st as planned. But as the news broke, it was clear that there had not been any real danger to the public at any time. Undercover police operators had been involved with the plan since its inception, from a CBC News article on July 2, 2013. Quote, Federal Public Safety Minister Vic Taves said the arrests were the result of close work between police and security agencies. The investigation, dubbed Project Souvenir, was launched in February 2013 and coordinated by the RCMP-led Integrated National Security Enforcement Teams, which include investigators from the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CSIS, and Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA. The success of this operation was due to the close collaboration of our security and law enforcement agencies, including CSIS, said Taves in Ottawa on July 2, 2013. I would like to applaud the RCMP-led Integrated National Security Enforcement Teams, known as INSET, and all of the partners for their outstanding work on this investigation. End quote. Nuttall and Karodi quickly appeared in a Surrey courtroom to be charged with conspiring together or with others to, to place an explosive in a government facility with intent to cause death or serious bodily injury for the benefit of a terrorist group and facilitating a terrorist group with possessing an explosive substance with the intent to endanger life or cause serious damage to property for the benefit of a terrorist group. Nuttall and Karodi were described by a CBC reporter, Steve Luz. Luz said, quote, Nuttall was tall and thin, with unprofessional-looking tattoos and untrimmed goatee and long hair. Nuttall smiled at Karodi and spoke briefly to the duty council assigned to the case. Luz said that Karodi had unkempt hair and bit her lips while her eyes darted around the courtroom. She repeatedly tried to make contact with Nuttall during the brief court appearance, end quote. What? Okay, what's a professional tattooed? Is that like having customers king tattooed on your forehead or something? No, no. Like, the, it's not like I'm a doctor professional. It's a professional tattoo artist as opposed to oh, somebody so, who doesn't know what they're doing. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> I thought you meant to. I was like sitting here going, what's a professional tattoo? Oh, boy. In a statement after the hearings, their lawyer denied Nuttall's connections to any organized group, nor did Nuttall have any membership or affiliations with a particular Muslim mosque. News began to trickle out about the accused couple painting an odd, disorganized picture of them, and that they were not exactly buttoned-down, single-minded jihadist terrorists. Instead, it appeared to some that the couple were struggling from mental health problems, as well as issues with drug addiction, and all that comes with that. However, the news organizations did their thing. If it bleeds, it leads. And the couple's trial by media began. The focus was on the alleged guilt of the pair, not what might have led them to do what they had, which would be of extreme importance later. When I came back to Canada, the one thing I noticed was that Canadian media is way less sort of investigative, if you will, or sharp than like in the UK or other places. Yeah. They seemed to me, like when I got here, it felt like they were, okay, we got the press release, now we're going to read it. Yeah, that's and, pretty much it. You know, or mm -hmm. or they jump on the bandwagon. There is some really good investigative there, journalism done. There are, but done. Gener like, generally, mm -hmm. there's a lot of weak, in my, my personal opinion, weak media in Canada, mm. right? And, um, you know, and th this is part of the problem with this whole story, right? right. Yeah. It, is that, you know, we want, we want the truth. You know? Yeah. Nuttall had played guitar in several independent punk and death metal bands, all of which have distanced themselves from Nuttall's actions, saying they in no way endorse violent ideals. Nuttall's Reverb Nation profile sports a photo of John with a collection of guitars one assumes is his. There are four songs to stream, In League with Satan, The End of the World, The News, and The End, in which the singer can be heard gutturally belting out the lyric, in the end, I will get you. 
While Amanda Carodi's police involvement was limited to her interactions with them during Project Souvenir, she had no criminal record. John Nuttall was another matter. All of his crimes up until the terrorism charges, however, had been related to issues with self-described lifelong drug addiction. From court documents, quote, Police database queries indicated that Mr. Nuttall had a criminal record and had been the subject of numerous complaints and investigations. Mr. Nuttall's criminal record included a conviction in 1995 for carrying a concealed weapon, convictions in 96 for robbery, kidnapping, and aggravated assault, a conviction in 1997 for assault, a conviction in 2002 for assault, and a conviction in 2003 for robbery. Mm, sounds like a real upstanding member of society. During the robbery for which Nuttall had been convicted in Victoria, John had hit a man over the head with a rock and then fled. A bystander called 911 and another chased Nuttall and held him until the police arrived to take him into custody. He was given another 18-month sentence in 2003, this time conditional. At that time, Nuttall's lawyer said that John was staying away from cocaine and weaning himself off methadone. The court document mentioned above continues. Mr. Nuttall had also been the subject of multiple entries in the RCMP's prime database, including two different 2010 files in which witnesses had reported seeing Mr. Nuttall use physical violence against Ms. Carodi, a 2001 report that Mr. Nuttall had vandalized a pharmacy after staff refused to fill his methadone prescription, and a 1995 report indicating that Mr. Nuttall was charged with attempted murder in relation to the collection of a drug debt. The databases indicated that Mr. Nuttall had medical and mental health issues as well as drug dependency. After the RCMP had gone through their two-bedroom apartment for clues with Nuttall and Karoti behind bars, the couple's Surrey landlords opened their basement suite for the media to, quote, document the messy squalor inside the suite, including a shot of a CRT television riddled with BB gun holes and the words MK Ultra scrawled across the plastic beneath the screen. The BC Civil Liberties Association had a lot to say about what they saw. From an article on bccla.org, images from inside the apartment, including posters and books, featuring Arabic writing, prescription methadone bottles belonging to Karoti, and printed photographs, were soon beamed across the country, offering a glimpse into the lives of two suspected terrorists. But a civil liberties organization and a tenants' right group are raising concerns about the fact that journalists were allowed in at all suggesting the media tours violated tenancy and privacy laws. It's illegal, said Josh Patterson, executive director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. As far as we're concerned, based on the information we know, it was illegal for the landlord to let anyone in or go in themselves. Patterson says provincial tenancy laws only allow landlords to enter suites with the permission of the tenant or in an emergency. Provincial privacy laws also forbid anyone to enter a private dwelling without permission. Just because you're accused of a crime, it doesn't mean that your landlord gets to have an open house, he said. Further on in the same article, Sergeant Peter Thiessen of the RCMP said he couldn't comment on any conversations between the landlord and police officers at the scene. We completed our search and have no further interest in that suite, and what the landlord may be allowing has nothing to do with the RCMP, said Thiessen. There's nothing criminal, and we have received no complaint in regards to unauthorized people being in that suite. Beyond that, it's up to the media to decide whether they have the legal authority to enter that suite. End quote. Uh, it's up to the media to decide whether or not they have the legal authority? Well, I mean, you know, here's a hot potato, and let's throw the hot potato it, around. It's illegal. It's his job to enforce it. He's saying it's up to the media? Mm-hmm. That's just bonkers. well. It might be a, a civil matter between tenant and landlord, which essentially absolves the RCMP of any involvement. And I think that's what's being said here. But at the same time, you know, nobody wanted to take accountability for what happened. The landlord let the media into their home, and then the landlord has the nerve to say, "Oh, well." I saw the media doing things that they probably shouldn't have, and they 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 had gone too far with like the, be in the place in the first place. No, like picking around I in know. possessions and stuff like that. Like, gosh, why did you let them in there? 
Wow. Yeah. A Global News article published days after the arrest quoted some of Nadal's friends, who, although they admitted he was troubled, could not believe he'd ever have been involved in a bombing plot. Quote, Known as Johnny to a friend who went to prom with him in 1994, she says he was troubled. He had a lot of dealings with the law and he spent time in jail. But the woman who prefers to be unnamed also says that when you caught him on a good day, he was kind, sensitive, very caring, very devoted. So it was a bit shocking to find out that he was capable of doing what he has been accused of doing. The last time the woman says she spoke with him was six years ago. And at the time, he was in a methadone program and on a, quote, good path and seemed to be getting his life together, end quote. But regardless of where he was in his recovery, she says in the 20 years she's known Nuttall, he was into role-playing games and alternate religions, and there was no mention of violence. On Groundhog Day, February 2, 2015, the terrorism trial of John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi began. Cops claim that the Boston Marathon bombings months before their own failed attempt at bombing the legislature was the couple's inspiration, right down to their use of common pressure cookers as the casing for their bombs. The trial took four months, over which the jury was shown hours of dramatic video, some of which showed Nuttall building the bombs and various angles of Nuttall placing the dud devices outside the legislature and audio recorded by police over the course of Project Souvenir. Only days before the attempted bombings, the couple had made a video in front of an Al-Qaeda flag talking about their intentions. Sounds pretty damning, right? Well, maybe not. The problem is, they were directed to do the video by the undercover operator who was handling them. The RCMP directed the video, provided the Islamic flag, and the undercover operator ran the camera. The video had to be re-recorded several times because John Nuttall kept losing his place and didn't quite understand what he had to say, always looking to the undercover operator behind the camera for direction. On the face of it, it looked as though John and Amanda were going to be convicted of what they'd been charged with and would go away for a very long time, giving the RCMP and their inset initiative a big win. It was complicated, though. There were a lot of difficult issues to navigate. The identities of the RCMP officers and others involved in the undercover operation had to be kept secret. As well, there were issues with CSIS, Canada's top spy agency, who'd also been involved. CSIS didn't want their methods of operation to be exposed, citing national security reasons. But as their involvement had been integral to the operation, the courts determined that in the interest of a fair trial for Nuttall and Karoti, the effort to keep these intelligence operations secret ultimately failed. According to the Vancouver Sun on the 8th of January 2016, quote, The case had shone a spotlight on the country's panoply of relatively untested anti-terror laws and the lack of legal experience involving them, end quote. Vice Magazine's Sarah Berman summed up the evidence she'd seen in the trial in her article titled, BC Terror Trial Reveals Gong Show RCMP Investigation. Quote, Nearly three months into the terrorism trial, about 90 hours of covert police recordings have revealed two sides of the RCMP sting. On one hand, you have gutcha footage of a dude assembling what he thinks is a pressure cooker bomb with the intent to die a martyr for jihad. On the other hand, the alleged two-person terrorist cell was exceedingly poor, sick, self-medicating, and irrational during their months-long interaction with law enforcement. The 240-officer investigation contemplated whether Nuttall was, quote, developmentally delayed or not months before he and his common-law spouse were arrested on four terrorism charges. The impoverished Surrey couple's Rambo-inspired plans varied wildly from minute to minute as police provided groceries, bus tickets, many hotel rooms, clothes, cigarettes, and eventually the inert C4 explosives used inside the fake bombs. Both accused were on methadone and welfare at the time. Thanks to the addict's wild imaginations, BC's Supreme Court has now heard enough chemtrail conspiracies and paintball gun punchlines. Nuttall thinks Michael Jackson was assassinated because he converted to Islam, for example. End quote. It took only two days of deliberation before the B.C. Supreme Court jury declared John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi guilty of conspiring to commit murder and possessing explosives for a terrorist organization. 
Lawyers for the couple set about appealing the, the decision on the grounds that they alleged Nuttall and Karoti had been entrapped by the police. And we'll take a break right here. And we are back. Matthew, were you aware of this case before uh, reading what you had so far? Vaguely. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there was a plot, supposedly. And then I maybe saw a headline saying they got off yeah. on some sort of technicality. Right. And But I never, I wasn't here, so I, I didn't really dive into it. But some things aren't adding up for me. Right. Right? They... So the, this couple seemed to, well, frankly, to be incapable of getting their own crap together in their own lives, let alone mastermind a terrorist attack. And I want to know, like, what got them on the, like, how did they end up in this place? How did they get on the radar in the first place? They live in a basement in Surrey doing drugs all day. Yeah. Right? Mm. Well, uh, trying to get off drugs as well. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, but you know, the reality is this is what they were doing, mm -hmm. and, and it's like, how how does this suddenly become a mastermind terror plot? Well, two? you're on the right track, okay, and we're going to get into that. Before the pair were sentenced, the appeal of their convictions went ahead. Friends and family who really knew John and Amanda claimed that although they both had their struggles, they would have never done what they'd been convicted of had the RCMP not held their hands to get them there. The appeal focused on just that, John Nuttall's ability, or rather his inability, to have planned and undertaken a bombing of the B.C. legislature without the assistance of the RCMP and the undercover operators involved in Project Souvenir. Much of what follows comes directly from subsequent appeal documents. In regard to terrorism, John Nuttall first came to the attention of Surrey RCMP in a report dated July 5, 2012. From court documents, quote, The report described an incident in which a woman, who was intoxicated when she spoke with the police, overheard Mr. Nuttall on the street speaking on a cellular phone in a loud voice about the afterlife and blowing up Islamic countries, end quote. But it was later that year that he hit the RCMP radar in a big way. On October 17, 2012, a man known only by the initials MC filed a complaint with the RCMP that alleged John Nuttall was espousing violent Islamic beliefs. MC's immediate concern was that John claimed to have killed a Jewish woman. MC also reported that he believed Nuttall had mental health issues. MC advised the police that John Nuttall had converted to Islam in 2011 and had been telling people he wanted to fight a holy war in Afghanistan. MC learned from other people that John frequented a mosque in Vancouver and had espoused radical extremist views. When the police attended Nuttall's residence to discuss MC's complaint, he told the police he was joking with MC. At the time of the police visit, John was intoxicated. The police found no evidence of any murder. They noted no signs of a struggle inside Nuttall's residence, and there had been no reports of shots fired in the neighborhood. Joking about that sort of stuff really sort of turns my stomach. Yeah. Um, even if it was just a joke, it's it's just gross. Yeah. And this MC person mm -hmm. was right to bring it to the, the authorities' attention. I think so too. If just I hear somebody, somebody yeah. who says, I'm going to blow people up, uh, I'm going to kill people. I have killed someone. Yeah, I'm probably going to have a conversation with someone in authority. Have a word saying, maybe got, maybe you should check this guy out a little bit. Right? Go have a look, yeah. yeah. After the police left John's apartment, MC called the RCMP again to report that Nuttall had left him messages calling him a traitor. He was careful to note that John had not threatened him. When the police returned to Nuttall's suite to question him about the call to MC, he was again intoxicated. Nuttall said he wanted to know why MC was calling the police and that it was MC who was the terrorist and wanted to do jihad. The police were sufficiently concerned about John's mental health to call Car 67 for an assessment. According to the BC RCMP's website, quote, Car 67 is a partnership between the Surrey RCMP and the Fraser Health Authority Mental Health and Addiction Services. 
a uniform RCMP member and a clinical nurse specializing in mental health work together respond to calls received involving emotional and mental health issues. The CAR-67 team will drive in an unmarked police vehicle to enhance privacy of the individuals and families that they serve. End quote. The next day, a CAR-67 officer and a psychiatric nurse attended Nuttall's residence. The nurse spoke with John, who by then was sober and calm, and concluded he was not suffering from a mental illness. The nurse also concluded Nuttall might be developmentally delayed because he spoke slowly and had difficulty understanding what the officer said to him. The MC complaint was flagged by the RCMP and eventually it reached the Integrated National Security Enforcement Team, EINSET, a division of the RCMP that deals with criminal activities that pose a risk to national security. On January 24, 2013, RCMP met with CSIS, who advised that John Nuttall might be a recent Muslim convert who was attempting to recruit others and might be capable of violence. CSIS disclosed that it was investigating Nuttall but it did not disclose specifics about the type of techniques they were using, nor did CSIS identify its source of intelligence on John Nuttall. John Stuart Nuttall was determined a, quote, threat to public safety, and the wheels were set in motion for Project Souvenir, an undercover operation involving, of course, a Mr. Big-like component in which undercover operators would supposedly surveil and become involved with Nuttall. You put that Mr. Big in there to poke poke me the bear, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> because you know, and our listeners know my stance on Mr. Big, like operations. Mm -hmm. You know, undercover surveillance is very different to Mr. Big operations mm -hmm. when they're getting involved. And you know, I've constantly said that cases are going to be reversed because of this approach. Well, <laughs> let's continue on okay. and hear what we have to uh, learn about this particular case. Okay. The RCMP surveillance of John Nuttall began on February 2nd, 2013, when two officers attended his basement suite in Surrey on the pretext of a domestic complaint in the neighborhood. The officers believed that Nuttall was high on marijuana and the basement suite had an overwhelming odor of weed. John acted nervously and referred to the officers as armed invaders. There were authentic-looking modified paintball guns hanging on the walls, a laptop was seen in the suite, and Islamic scripts and empty liquor bottles were visible to the officers. The officers noted that an elderly female resided with John and Amanda in their basement suite. The RCMP later learned that this elderly woman was Nuttall's grandmother. The purpose of the visit was to learn the identity of Nuttall's wife. She identified herself as Amanda Carodi, but had no identification. You know, that's the second time the term Islamic, Islamic script has been mentioned. Yeah. And I find it interesting that nobody's saying what it said. They're talking about it's the font or, you know, the script, or the alphabet, right? Mm -hmm. It, it could have been a particular saying that they didn't want to repeat. Yeah, maybe it was. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, I was talking to a friend who's Muslim once, and and he's he's he was saying that people seem to have this weird fear of our alphabet. Yeah, like if you Google Arabic Coca Cola can, it actually just looks really cool, and it says "Enjoy Coca Cola." But if you stuck that on a black flag and put it in front of your house, people would be calling the authorities or like or like egging your house or something. Yeah. Right? And um, the other thing, my other question is, and I'm not sort of a professional linguist or, but shouldn't it be called Arabic script, not Islamic script? Yeah. Like is the Roman alphabet script considered the Christian script? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, I, I'm just pointing this out because it's like, um, just having spoken to a friend, yeah. right? Is, is that there is this weird thing as soon as you see something, even if it says love thy brother in Arabic, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people freak out because they don't know what it says. And it, and you can understand why, you know, so many media, you know, newscasts showing, you know, jihadists with the flag, sure. just very specific things. And that's all people saw. But mm -hmm. yeah. You and I talked about this a little bit before we started, but I had an experience where I saw someone asking a question of some very conservative folks should we be using Arabic numerals in the United States? And I'm not putting Americans down. D don't, 
don't get me wrong. It's not Americans in general. Just, this was the story. Yeah. This was the story. It was a, it was a very conservative uh, group that this person was asking. And without fail, all of them said, no, we shouldn't be using anything uh, that has to do with Arabs. So that, that, for those of you who don't know, number one, two, three, four, so, five. Uh, Persian. It yeah. came out of Persia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Starting on the 23rd of February, 2013, was the first of the numerous scenarios that would make up Project Souvenir's undercover operation. From court documents, Corporal A, Nuttall's main contact in the operation, went to the gas station store where John Nuttall was seen to buy groceries and snacks, and he exchanged glances with Nuttall. Over the next few meetings, Corporal A pretended he was an Arab businessman who was looking for his niece who had left home because she disagreed with her household's strict Islamic rules. Over time, his role changed to a wealthy benefactor-like businessman who had contacts with those interested in extremist jihad. This new role came into being after John Nuttall first mentioned violent jihad. Eventually, Corporal A was seen as a trusted friend and brother as well as a spiritual advisor to Nuttall. On March 3rd, 2013, during the third scenario, Corporal A met Amanda Korodi, who was wearing a niqab. Mr. Nuttall had very conservative views on women. In his view, they had to obey their husbands or be beaten. Mr. Nuttall had told Corporal A that he wanted to build rockets and fire them at the Parliament buildings. He said he had his plan on his laptop, although no plan was ever found on that computer. Corporal A gave Mr. Nuttall $100 during that meeting. Over the next number of scenarios, the undercover operators did their thing, ramping up Nuttall's involvement with a shadowy organization with access to cash, a desire for jihad, and the want for John Nuttall to be involved with them. They provided John with cash, a burner phone, and gifts to perform different tasks for them, including delivering a package containing a USB device to a locker for $200. Nuttall didn't do himself any favors to steer police away from him. Among other things the RCMP gathered, Nuttall had showed Corporal A videos that inspired him to build the rockets. He told Corporal A that he was capable of building one. He showed Corporal A videos of Chechen men beheading Russian soldiers. He opened the anarchist cookbook on his computer, turned to the explosives recipes, and told Corporal A that he had tried to make napalm and that he wanted to make TNT. He told Corporal A that he did not download anything from extremist jihad websites while at home, but only did so using public Wi-Fi hotspots. John asked Corporal A if he could get him an invitation to a violent jihadist website. John mentioned to Corporal A that Amanda wished to attack a synagogue to kill Jewish children. Nuttall also expressed a desire to kill Canadian soldiers returning to a Squimalt Navy base from Afghanistan. He suggested firing homemade rockets into the base. Nuttall told Corporal A he would do anything Corporal A wanted him to do related to violent jihad. Sure, there was always a lot of ranting by John, but never really a plan. The undercover operators wanted John to come up with a concrete idea, but it didn't seem to happen. On April 15, 2013, the day after the 8th scenario, the Sarnav brothers detonated pressure cooker bombs at the Boston Marathon. Corporal A called John to determine whether he had turned his mind to the bombing, but Nuttall made no reference to it. According to a W-5 documentary, time and time again the undercover operator asked John Nuttall what his plan was, becoming frustrated, and he began to push for one. John did come up with one idea, but the undercover operator seemed to have a hard time keeping John on task. John said that he wanted to hijack a particular via rail passenger train inspired by another real via rail terrorist plan. John was shocked to find out that the train hadn't had passengers for years, so another disjointed plan went into the bin. John then said he was afraid that he'd be killed by the organization for not coming up with a more feasible plan. Corporal A reassured John, telling him not to worry that he was with him every step of the way. In May and early June, once it was clear that the train plot was nonsensical due to the lack of a passenger train in Victoria, the investigative team struggled with whether to end the operation. Some officers articulated a concern that the operation was overly influential. 
and that the police might turn John Nuttall into a terrorist when he lacked the capacity to be one on his own. Corporal A had become Nuttall's prime source for things Islamic. John, at times, expressed doubts and having had a conscience about performing violent jihadist acts. Nuttall asked Corporal A whether he should go to an imam at a mosque for guidance, and Corporal A counseled Nuttall away from the idea. John came back to his idea of building rockets and firing them at the legislature buildings and the Esquimalt military base, but was having a lot of trouble putting together the materials required. John suggested that the rockets be symbolic, without warheads. So all of this, I've just been sitting here listening. Yeah. Would be lo- like laughable if it wasn't so serious. Mm-hmm. Like I could literally, like I'm writing a comedy film script in my head yeah. with these scenarios, with lots of slapstick and one-liners. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of journalists who really dug into this mm-hmm. really did point out the ridiculousness okay. of what was going on. On June 6, 2013, John Nuttall finally hit on the idea of building a pressure cooker bomb. According to court documents, John had downloaded instructions onto his computer on how to build a homemade explosive device. John had also found information on how to build a pressure cooker bomb, which were found in an issue of Al-Qaeda's online magazine. Nuttall refused to do such research at his home because he feared detection, So Corporal A gave him instructions on the use of the anonymous Tor browser that allowed John to download these instructions at home. John talked about a big plan that would produce a body count as high as 9-11 to make people rethink sending troops overseas to kill Muslims. He said that the pressure cooker bomb idea would have the same body count as his rocket idea and could be carried out more quickly. The police loved the pressure cooker bomb idea and it became their plan. And the BC legislature was the target and July 1st, Canada Day, would be the day. It was the undercover operators who made the decision about where and when the attacks should happen. John wanted to build a test pressure cooker bomb before he went to the trouble of making the real thing. When it came to what he would use as an explosive, not all told Corporal A his idea to use cow manure. It wasn't clear how he came up with that idea, but it clearly wouldn't have worked. John asked Corporal A about gunpowder and C4. Corporal A arranged to have a meeting with another undercover operator in which they would talk about getting C4 for pressure bombs, to which the other operator, of course, agreed. Corporal A took John and Amanda shopping to pick up the supplies they required to build the bombs. From court documents, quote, They went to Save On Foods where Mr. Nuttall bought batteries. They went to Walmart where Mr. Nuttall bought a pressure cooker. They went to other stores without buying anything. They made purchases at Value Village. At London Drugs, they took passport photos and bought another pressure cooker. At Home Depot, Mr. Nuttall bought nails, nuts, and bolts, and other material for his pressure cooker bombs. Corporal A then took the couple to a safe house, a motel outside the city where they would build the bombs. John and Amanda had expressed concerns about what would happen to their pet cat after they went through with the plot. Again from court documents, quote, The next day, on June 27, 2013, the group went shopping again to pick up prescription methadone from Ms. Karoti and to buy the outstanding items on the shopping list, such as bleach, sponges, gloves, and alarm clocks. Throughout their shopping trip, Corporal A had to repeatedly redirect the couple to what they still needed from their list. At one point, Mr. Nuttall returned from a store without purchasing nails, though buying nails was the reason that he had entered the store. Mr. Nuttall and Ms. Karoti again expressed concern that they had spent all of their rent money and said that they did not even have enough left to buy coffee and that they did not want to live on the street. Corporal A told Mr. Nuttall that there would be work for them after the plot was executed and that they would not have to live on the street, end quote. The police watched John and Amanda bumbling through the job of constructing the bombs as their motel room was, of course, wired for audio and video. Corporal A made the arrangements for travel on the ferry to transport Amanda and John to Victoria, 
on June 30th for their operation on the morning of July 1st. From court documents, on July 1st, 2013, quote, John woke Amanda up at 3 a.m. saying, wake up for jihad. He took some of their methadone and saved some for after the explosions. John told Amanda not to say anything to police if they were apprehended. He said that everything was falling into place. They left the room at 4 a.m. to meet Corporal A. When he got in the car, John reiterated he was not going to kill any children, and Corporal A agreed. Corporal A gave the couple more instructions about waiting for him to pick them up in the van after they placed the bombs. En route, Nuttall said he wanted to go over the pressure cookers, but Corporal A said not to worry about them. End quote. When they had parked, Corporal A uncovered the pressure cookers to show the couple the C4. He asked if they still wanted to plant the devices, and Nuttall said he did not want to hear that question again. Corporal A drove around the grounds of the Parliament buildings once and asked John if he believed there was enough C4 in the devices. John said he didn't know, that Corporal A was the expert. Nuttall expressed concern about traces of their DNA being left in the vehicle that Corporal A was driving, and he mentioned an idea he'd already expressed, that of wanting to blow the van up with the C4 inside. Corporal A said no, that they had to stick with the pressure cooker plan. Corporal A let the couple out of the van, John with his two pressure cookers and Amanda with her one, and the pair set off to place the bombs and planters around the legislature, spots, of course, predetermined by the police so they could be watching. All the while, from multiple vantage points, RCMP were recording audio and video. There never was any real danger to the public at all during the operation. John and Amanda hopped back into the van and were driven by Corporal A back to the BC Ferry Terminal and to the motel safe house in Delta. There, the couple watched TV for news of the detonation of the bombs. When they didn't see any mention of the bombing, John said he felt the government might be suppressing the news of the attacks. From court documents, at 11.45 a.m., Corporal A called and Mr. Nuttall told him the bombs had not gone off. Corporal A said that they would get a flight and be out of the country before 3 p.m. When he got off the phone, Mr. Nuttall was angry and said the pressure cookers had worked before he had handed them off. So, Corporal A must have done something to them. Ms. Karoti agreed. As they packed, Mr. Nuttall prayed that the devices would still detonate, but not when children were around. Corporal A called back and told them to leave everything in the motel room except the clothes they were wearing, and that they were to be transported to an airport. When they stepped into the hallway at 1.50 p.m., they were arrested, and the operation concluded. End quote. The appeal judge poured over the evidence and concluded that the conduct of the police in this case was so egregious that the only conclusion that could be drawn was that they manufactured the crime and therefore entrapped the defendants, and this amounted to an abusive process. Justice Catherine Bruce continued with her analysis and found that, point one, this was a case of truly manufactured crime by the RCMP and not a case where the police simply instigated, originated, or brought about the offense. Two, the police focused their investigation on two people who held terrorist beliefs but no apparent capacity or means to plan, act, and carry through with their religiously motivated objectives. Three, the police counseled, directed, urged, and instructed, and molded them into people who, with significant and continuous supervision and direction by the police, ultimately played a role in the terrorist defense. 4. While Mr. Nuttall first identified the pressure cooker as an explosive device, he wanted to use it as a tester, and the closest he got to an explosive device on his own was to talk about using cow manure. Police seized on the pressure cooker idea and it became their plan. The police had to provide the explosive substance. The police had to take the defendants shopping and give continuous instructions and direction until they bought what they needed to make the bombs. The police constructed the device and left the gluing of the nails and construction of the timers to the defendants. The police had to arrange for location for the defendants to work on the devices and provide constant supervision and direction. The police had to ensure the defendants received their daily methadone prescription. The police chose the date for the explosion. 
The police made all the arrangements for the accommodation and traveled to Victoria. The police chose where the devices would be planted. The day-to-day -day dealings with the defendants demonstrated absurd character of the undercover operation. Mr. Nuttall broke down after the failed train plan and said that he was not a general and could not be expected to create a workable plan. Corporal A responded by assuring them that he would be taken through to the end one baby step at a time. The police, in fact, had to take the defendants one baby step at a time to bring the undercover operation to an end with an arrest. The police led the defendants to the end through manipulation, cajoling, instructing, installation of fear, offers of friendship, offers of reward, and offers of religious guidance throughout the operation, and the police could not continue with an indefinite undercover operation but rather than turn the operation back to CSIS, given there was no imminent risk of criminal activity, they manufactured a crime that amounted to entrapment. That's uh, rightfully pretty damning list from the judge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing was a total farce. And she actually used the word farce. Did she? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I don't, honestly, like, I don't think the people involved were like total morons or anything like that. I think... Somehow this train got started mm -hmm. and once you start investing the time and, and it c becomes this massive thing, yeah, it, it's hard for any individual to get it off the track. Right. You know, I think it was a, it was a policy and process issue more than anything else here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The judge determined that police were quote, clearly overzealous and acted on the assumption that there were no limits to what was acceptable when investigating terrorism, end quote. She also wrote, quote, Moreover, to permit the defendant's conviction to stand in the face of this kind of police misconduct would be offensive and would cause irreparable damage to the integrity of the justice system, end quote, and that there should be a stay of proceedings in the case. The judge continued, quote, the specter of the defendant serving a life sentence for a crime that police manufactured by exploiting their vulnerabilities, by instilling fear that they would be killed if they backed out, and by quashing all doubts they had in the religious justifications for the crime, is offensive to our concept of fundamental justice. Simply put, the world has enough terrorists. We do not need the police to create more out of marginalized people who have neither the capacity nor sufficient motivation to do it themselves, end quote. In a CBC article, Crown attorney Peter Eccles expressed disappointment outside the courthouse. Quote, These are two individuals who have the ideology, who have the motivation, because let's face it, they did do it, he said. They are quite capable of committing murder for an ideological purpose, which they were very keen to do. As we've seen in the last six weeks, Lone participants are undeniably the greatest challenge for law enforcement to face. Okay, so I have something to say to Peter. Okay. Stop covering up the massive faults that are obvious to us all in this investigation. Yeah. Right? As a public, we want the truth, not face-saving, especially when it comes to something like domestic terrorism. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I think all of us might just want to feel safe and be safe. Right. Yeah. And at the same time, we don't, as a society, we live in a society where we do not want our rights trampled or anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And that are, uh, and we don't want our processes to include entrapment. Right. You know? For sure. So, so I get it. Right. I get that this is hard work. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it, but. There is a balance between being vigilant and being a free and just society. Yeah. And, but, and that, but that's what he's not understanding. That is the job. It's not an either or. Mm. The, the job is both. Right? Yeah. And, you know, stuff like this, I think, probably just makes the hard work, working folks in security job harder because what this has created is, is a massive blow to public trust mm -hmm. and you need that trust to be effective in doing this sort of stuff. Yeah. Right. The BC Civil Liberties Association cheered the result. Grace Pastine, litigation director for the BCCLA stated, quote, 
the decision is a resounding rebuke of the RCMP's illegal activities and improper tactics in this investigation, manipulating and exploiting marginalized people in order to push them to do criminal acts as they would be incapable of doing on their own is an affront to democratic freedoms. What is especially troubling is that this costly, cockamamie investigation was seen as a national priority for RCMP headquarters and was watched carefully by very senior officials. There should be no clearer signal that there is an urgent need for enhanced accountability for the RCMP's national security activities. We are also deeply concerned that the couple appear to have been improperly targeted based on their religious beliefs. There is an unquestionable need to prevent criminal acts of violence, but the RCMP's investigation did nothing to make Canada safer, and their tactics ran counter to our deeply held Canadian values. End quote. According to a CTV news article, Phil Gursky, who was an analyst from CSIS at the time of the undercover operation and who testified for the Crown believes that the RCMP operation was professional and the couple were capable of committing terrorist activities. I think that they were in fact capable. Gursky told W5, they certainly had the intent, end quote. John and Amanda were released. Their appeal was upheld in 2018 Outside the courtroom in 2018, John Nuttall's lawyer, Marilyn Sanford, said that the ruling was a victory against police entrapment. Here's some audio, as obtained by Global News. I think it means a lot. I think that the court has drawn a line uh, and underscored that that these type of American-style sting operations, very common south of the border, are not going to be tolerated here, and that we have a a, a strong and robust uh, principle of entrapment that the courts are going to uphold. And, um, and this case went far over that line, and the police, in manufacturing this crime, uh, crossed a line that the courts aren't going to allow in future. So yes, I think that, that this experiment um, has, 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 uh, has led to this decision and, and the, the reinforcement of our laws. John Nuttall's mom, Maureen Smith, said she cheered when she heard the news that John would be released. Here's some more audio from a global news item. I went, woohoo! I was so excited. I sent, woohoo! I typed that out and put it on Facebook and texted everybody I knew. And uh, I was like so excited. And, um, you know, I, it was such a relief. And I just thought, and in, actually, just before I found out, I kept trying to calm myself down and say, have faith, have faith, you know, and lots of people have been praying and stuff for them and uh, including me and so it was pretty exciting just like awesome I even called the Surrey RCMP talked to the head guy on July 1st or 2nd I guess it was uh, 2013 and I said I'm the mother of John and I said you've got the wrong person like my son would never do that and I still I know that to this day I've even heard him say that to the undercover police on the videos that he could never kill anyone and killing one person would be like killing all of humanity and that's John he he was like he it's like um he couldn't do he could he would never be able to do something like that and he never did documents obtained by the Canadian press through a freedom of information request show the mounties paid at least 200 people mostly police officers $911,090.54 for overtime during Project Souvenir. That's overtime only. According to an article on Global News, quote, the bulk of the project's overtime expenses, $519,039.55, went to 100 constables involved in the case, while 30 corporals were paid $128,369.76, and 24 sergeants received $69,494.65. Records show the Vancouver Police Department was given $92,397, though it's unclear how that money was divided. The overall cost of the operation was not provided. Without a breakdown of the number of work hours and officer ranks, it's difficult to estimate the overall cost. Given that the enumeration ranges from a starting salary of $48,000 a year for constables and $107,000 for staff sergeants and beyond. 
the numbers don't include the cost of court time either, which sources told Global News works out to be about $5,000 a day. End quote. In a 2017 episode of CTV's W5 in an exclusive interview, you can see it on YouTube, John Nuttall and Amanda Carodi spoke out. The whole thing was just so conniving from the very beginning, said Carodi. You just don't wake up one morning and decide to be a bomber, added Nuttall. These guys groomed us for six months to do this. We certainly didn't want to hurt a bunch of random Canadians on Canada Day, said Carodi. They're just innocent people going through their daily lives. Nuttall said, It's akin to the fire department going around setting blazes, lighting houses on fire, and then they'll show up in the nick of time and put the fires out, just so they can pat themselves on the back. End quote. I don't want to hear very much from them, um, but what should have happened uh, would be, you know, the police shouldn't have just walked away, obviously, mm -hmm. but they should have put them on a watch list. Yeah, surveil them. A watch list, surveillance, keep keep an eye on, check check them, yeah. right? The, the, the time and the expense placed on this was such a waste. It was ridiculous. And I fear the public is saying, you know, because this is what I said, I'm like, is this the best you could do? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I actually like this sort of story makes me feel less safe, not more safe. Right. Because I just think, wow, they're, like, they're just going after people that would never have been able to pull this off. Yeah. They're focusing their uh, resources in the wrong direction, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and there, there are probably people who this type of operation, the person would have had a good plan. The person would have walked themselves yeah, through the yeah, whole thing and, and they could have just and, sort of and, been surveilled at the and, time. And Mike, when I was living in London, the, the hardest thing for mm. the, also for the public to, to, to deal with is when we find out that somebody did get away with it was just put on surveillance. So it's a tough job. Right. Right. And, and so all of that being said, at the same time, you know, we need to be thankful and celebrate the professionals out there who are protecting us. Mm hmm. Um, like, have you heard of the 2006 Ontario terrorism plot? Yep. Right. If anyone just Google that, like that's... that was referred to in a lot of the notes that I read about this particular case. So there were references to it. So, so yeah. So that's big and scary and, and they're great people doing a great job. And, and I think, like I said already, like, I, I think nobody went in with the wrong intention here. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, like this was kind of at the height of, like lots of terrorist acts. Yeah. And there was probably a big public outcry of do something and fear. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that, that would have been so strong for me, uh, uh, being one of these investigators yeah. to just to keep it going. Right. So I just think honestly, there's some hard lessons to be learned. And I think it's just a track that people couldn't get off of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is it for dark poutine episode 220 is set up the bombing that never was. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Oh, Matthew, I guess it's time for us to listen to people tell us stories on our voicemail machine. So... Let's listen to the first one. Let's crank it up. Hi, we're calling from a wedding. Uh, first time callers, long time listeners. I'm with the bride. My name's Chanel, and this is Brianna. Brianna from Buena Vista. You uh, did a shout out to me. I forget the episode 180 something, but you guys are so awesome. And we both really enjoy listening to you. Keep up the good work. We're real good eggs, and we're having a real good time at my matrimony tonight, baby. Bye. Whoop. I love that a f bride and friend, maybe bridesmaid, called on their wedding day. Isn't that weird? Like That's so cool. You you were thinking of us on your wedding day. <laughs> well, you know, in, you, there's the, the highest chance of the person that's going to murder you is the one that you're married to. Oh, dear. <laughs> we, we, maybe she was thinking about that. Oh, no. But we're, we're hoping that that isn't the case in... in... I'm sure it's not. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> That's fantastic. 
I want now I want people to call us like on their graduation or on their on their Canadian citizenship swearing in ceremony or something. Yeah, like whenever you think of Dar Poutine, just give us a call. Except when you're on the crapper, because you it, know you're supposed to be doing it in your hat. Oh dear. <laughs> well, hopefully people aren't doing it in their hat. Let's listen to a third voicemail. Looks like it might be another one from Nova Scotia, which I'm okay with. Hi, Matthew and Mike. This is Maggie Curley. I'm from Nova Scotia. I'm in the younger yard. I just wanted to say hello and that you guys are awesome and to go shit in your hat. <laughs> Always wanted to say that. Anyways, um, just keep doing what you're doing. I just listened to the first UFO episode and it's freaking awesome. I love it. I actually think, me personally, I actually think that we've been visited. it. Yep. Yep. Think I'm crazy. It's all right. Anyways, have an awesome day. Love you. Bye. Well, thank you. Another Nova Scotian Yumber Yarder calling us up. Much appreciated. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, it, lots of people have listened to the uh, UFO episodes and love them, but then some some have come don't, at don't. us over it. So. Well, you know, we got to do some fun ones every once exactly. in a while. Exactly. Here's the thing. Matthew and I, we've talked about this a number of times on the show, and we'll talk about it again. I cannot do true crime. I cannot talk about murder week every, in and week every out. Every single time. Because yeah. it hurts my head. And it hurts soul. my heart. <laughs> and I feel like I, I honestly wake up thinking about these some of these awful cases. Yeah. And so UFOs... I'm not waking up thinking about UFOs. Well, not yet. <laughs> that might happen. I don't know. Maybe I'll write about some UFOs in my next book. Could happen, you know? Maybe. Anyway, here is another voicemail. Wow, we've had a few this week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know whether it's nasty, but I just thought it was interesting. I was listening to one of your podcasts, obviously, um, about Brock Graham um, from Victoria um, and being a police officer in RCMP and the possibility of him um, getting out very soon is very high. Um, and I understand he's um, going for UTAs um, within the next couple of weeks, not months. And now I hear these are Canadian... Um, inmates who've served uh, life sentence, if not more, are going to be getting loads and loads of taxpayers' money because they are crying that they had to be in solitary confinement for any length of time, and our government, Correction of Canada, is actually going to be paying them thousands of dollars. And here are the victims out here living day to day as best as they can under the circumstances, this COVID and everything else, I just don't understand the system. And I hope to God that someone besides myself being a victim of crimes, that it could be broadcast and someone needs to be listening. Seriously. How are they entitled to that money? That should be going to the victims. Thank you. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, it's weird. It's like uh, there's some there's some stuff going on. You'll have to Google that, folks, to, to get into it uh, a little deeper. But yeah, Brock Graham shouldn't be getting out of jail anytime soon, but it's looking like that might happen. That's such a shame. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's really interesting. Like the, the parole board and all that kind of stuff, they're, they have a, I think they have a mandate to put, to release so many people a year. It's like... The, Why would you get a mandate like that? I don't know. We have numbers that we have to meet mm -hmm. because it costs money to keep a prisoner in jail. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I could think of cutting other things. Yeah, right to your MP. That I'd be happy to have cut in order to keep people who should be in jail in jail. So a great idea would be to uh, go to the, Cana the Canada.ca site, the Government of Canada site. Find your MP. Find your MP and write him a note and say, or why her. are him or... Find your MP and write him or her a note. Find your MP and write them a note. Yeah. And send them a message about 
why on earth, asking why on earth, people who have had a life sentence and have done such horrible things are getting out? Why is this happening? I do that. Not on this specific, but... Yeah. I, you know, I can yell and scream on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Or I've, I've reached out to my MP probably about four times since I moved to Canada. Oh, wow. Just thinking... This is the this is my representative. Yep. Um, and this is the action I can take. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's move on. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Next up, we have Patreon. Patreon. I'm looking forward to Patreon this week. First up, boy, our first. (laughs) What was that? I'm not, I'm going to edit it out. (laughs) That sounded really funny. Our first patron this week is Chantal Fournier. And Chantal is from Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, What on earth does Chantal do there in Sudbury, Ontario, Matthew? With a name like that, I Mm -hmm. think she's a pastry chef. She's Oh, that is actually a nice thing. Fournier's pastries. Ah, yes. Yeah? Yeah. It works, doesn't it? It does. Chantal Fournier. Yes. Oh, yes. Because it's kind of like Chantilly, you know, that one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm your baker, Chantal Fournier. Yes, I'm here for your... Uh, Bakery needs. For your croissants. Next we have Reese Gray. And I don't know where Reese is from, and I'm hoping Reese is an alien, because last name Gray could be a gray alien. Mm. Uh, not Not to insult you, but perhaps... Perhaps it's an alias. I don't mm. know. But where is Reese from? Why? Why? Yeah, she's from Y, Arizona. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were asking me a question. No, there's a place called Y. It's like who's on first? No, W-H-Y, Arizona. Okay. Why? Yeah. Why? Why is she there? <laughs> yeah. She, she moved there specifically to figure out why. Oh, well, there you go. She's trying to figure out why the town is there. Wow. Yeah, so she's kind of an archaeologist in that way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's kind of cool, actually. That's 115 people. Uh, Wow. Yep. 115 whole individuals in Y. Next up, we have Catherine Collette. And Catherine doesn't say where she's from, and she's opted out of receiving benefits by mail, which is fine. And uh, what on earth does Catherine, where on earth is Catherine Collette from? Why not? Oh, that sounds like a Nova Scotia last name. There's a lot of why nots in Nova Scotia. Why not Mississippi? Why not Mississippi? Yep. Okay. Why not? What (laughs) what does she do and why not? I think... She is actually colluding with our patron from Y. So why and why not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so they just ask each other those questions over again. Well, over I, and over I, again. I think she at what and why not? Mm-hmm. Um, she's trying to give people good reasons why they should not be doing some things. Okay, but maybe she, her she is the answer to why. We, we, why these, not? These two cities should be twinned. Why and why not? Yeah. Hmm. Why? Why not? (laughs) But why? (laughs) Well, thank you, Catherine. (laughs) Oh, dear, oh, dear. Next we have from Niagara Falls, Ontario, Tammy Boucher. Tammy Boucher. Tammy Boucher. Boucher. Niagara Falls. I love Niagara Falls. I I love to go to the falls and listen because it drowns out my tinnitus in my ears. Oh, you should live on the water. I should live on the water and listen to the falls because I can't hear my tinnitus when I'm I'm there. So it's really kind of nice. But okay, what does Tammy Boucher do there in Niagara Falls? You know those beds that vibrate when you put a quarter into them? <laughs> yes. She fixes them. She's a vibrating bed repair person. Yeah. Oh well, there you go. 
the only one I've ever seen is in um, Niagara Falls. It, like, did you see it in real life in Niagara Falls? When I was Falls? a kid in the 70s. Did you use it, you and your brother? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you lay there and go, ah. <laughs> Of course you did. Of course you did. This... Why did they, Why did they make those? It's for the sex. Really? Yeah, it's for sexy time. My mom told me it was for a massage. And I was like, this doesn't make my back feel any better. No, but it, it's for sexy time. Anyway. That's just lazy. Yeah, exactly. You'll figure it out. You'll get there, Matthew. <laughs> oh, that's, boy. That's what she said. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Well, that's it for uh, patrons. Uh, let's move on to Donut Money Donors. We did have somebody interact, e-transfer us some money, and it's our friend from the Yumber Yard, Lori St. Germain. Lori. And Lori says, hi, Mike, Matthew, and Steve. Treats for all from Lori. Yay, well, thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. Uh, much appreciated. And where is Lori, Lori from? Hot Coffee, Mississippi. Hot Coffee, Mississippi. Yeah. How, where are you from? I'm from Hot Coffee, Mississippi. <laughs> I love it down there. The Let southern, it... southern. Hey, we got, we love southern hospitality so much. We've got hot coffee in our name. You tried hard not to go into what's his name's voice there, didn't Leslie you? Leslie Jordan? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I can do a very good Leslie Jordan impression, but. You can. And, anyway, because uh, I've met him. But uh, it was so okay. So she's from Hot Coffee. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to take a wild guess about where we're going with this. She works in a cafe. No, a tea house. Oh, it's called the Tea House of the August Moon. That is a play that I was in in high school. Really? And played the role. Oh, I'm cringing. That Marlon Brando played. In the movie, okay, which was an Asian man. Oh no! With an Asian accent. Oh no! Yeah, it was terrible. It's so racist and un not woke. <laughs> it is terrible. Well, this is the seventies before before anyone understood woke. I guess. Well, yeah, and before, but it was just like, yep, yeah. So I know exactly the tea house of the August Moon. I have been in the play. So okay. Anyway. I what? think I've seen the play. Yeah, so she owns a cafe called uh, a a tea house called the Tea House of the August Moon in Hot Coffee, Mississippi. Well, there you go. That's great. <laughs> That's really great, actually. I'm now. I'm, I need a cup of coffee and maybe you know I love going for tea. We should go for high tea with a bunch of listeners in Vancouver. Oh, at the hotel, or afternoon at the tea. hotel down, downtown. Well, that one's expensive, but there are less expensive places that we could go that are. Like afternoon tea and not high tea, but well, if you want to act posh, you gotta, you gotta. Yeah. Matthew, you gotta do I do I look in any way posh? No, but no. if you're going for high tea, you're, I like you're... how you said no really quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I know I asked you, and you honestly told me. <laughs> but yeah, I would like to go for tea. That would be very nice. That'd Let's do fun. that at some point. Yep. Uh, next from our PayPal. Donut Money Donors, we have another Yumber Yarder, Patricia Debkowski. Hello, Patricia. And I don't know where Patricia's from. I really don't. She's in a town of 900 people called mm -hmm. Rough and Ready, California. Rough and Ready, California. Yeah. Wow. She owns a silk shop. A silk shop. Yeah. And uh, does she actually have the silk made there? Are the little silkworms doing their thing in the back? or? No, she imports them. Right oh, what? That's boring. <laughs> I, I just kind of would like to see the little worms doing their thing. That would be more fun. Anyway, thank you, patrons and Donut Money donors. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 
If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Not a bad apple. Don't be a bad apple. Be a good egg. Be a good egg. Goodbye, good eggs. Okay, bye. Bye.